Costa Rica, <laughs> Costa yes. Rica has higher happiness levels than the USA. They yes. live longer on average than people in the USA, and they use about a third, a quarter of the resources. In, in your, I mean, you, you you were in a think tank. You should you should know how to solve this problem. <laughs> the most important thing is that people progress their work every day and they don't have big setbacks. That so the, the, the big five drivers of happiness at work are connect, be fair, being fair, okay. empowering people, challenging them and inspiring them. Uh, I saw a picture of you and the Dalai Lama. I, I came back from it and uh, I said to my son, who was about 10 at the time, I said, ah, oh, I think I want to become a Buddhist monk, you know, <laughs> and he looked and he looked at me and he goes, well, you've got the body already, dad. Oh. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson and John Locke, uh, Locke um, he, they they have this endowed by God, by their creator to the pursuit, blah, 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 blah. Some other data, which is which is less clear on the sort of um, intrinsic spirituality. The former, um, you know, uh, communist bloc is actually quite unhappy. They, they disrupted the family ties at the bottom. So I think some of it is almost certainly a legacy of that. Hello, friends. Welcome to Headspace, where we explore how our headspace today, the way we see the world, can dramatically change our life space tomorrow. Today, I speak with Nick Marks. It's an amazing interview you're about to watch. I've been looking forward to it for a while. He is an independent policy advisor, speaker, statistician, and author. He's best known for his Happy Planet Index as a fellow of the New Economics Foundation in London. Brilliant, brilliant guy. I love his view on a macro level and his heart, his humanity. He's also a psychologist, so he has these, these amazing insights from all kinds of different angles. I really enjoyed talking to him. I think you'll find it um, insightful, fascinating, and perhaps transformative if you're that kind of person. So in advance, I want to ask you to subscribe share comment rate wherever you are thank you in advance and put a plug as always for a couple of things that we're doing that we're interested in that we want you to possibly be interested in or invest the first one is the ascend academy it's an after school academy in maputo mozambique where we teach kids who are below the poverty line and we help them with mentorship which builds their character English language and computer science. Um, it's an amazing program. Check it out, Ascend Academy. And uh, if your heart is moved to do so, please donate, help us build it out and help those kids. The second one is Third Drive Media, which is a marketing company that I co-own with a friend of mine. And I love the work we do for small and medium businesses, nonprofits, churches as well, to help them shape their message create a brand and then infuse all of that across all the different mediums starting from branding websites video all of that stuff we do really good work check it out thirddrivemedia.com and now back to headspace thank you for enduring my plug um, I, I i hope that some of you will find it valuable actually and um, please enjoy my conversation with the very brilliant nick marks <laughs> Welcome to the show. I am so, so excited to have you. Thanks very much for asking me. So uh, I am a huge fan of your TED Talks and all kinds of videos that you've put out there, your materials. And what I love about you is that you have this high level, like bird's eye level, micro level um, view of happiness, what makes people happy, what, pe what makes nations happy. Uh, can you give us like a? Can you give us like the bullet points, and we'll dive into some rabbit holes here. So, yes, I I am a statistician, so um, yeah. I'm interested in the big picture because that's really how statistics work. But also, personal level, I trained as a therapist when I was young, so I've got like quite an individual connection with people as well. I'm very and curious that... to explore that. By the way, how can you go <laughs> so high and so in depth all at the same time? Right. So go go on well, go on. Well, I, I, it was sort of, it was a split personality that's become integrated over the decades, I think. <laughs> right, <yeah>. So, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm interested in people. I, I'm a relatively happy guy myself, and I became interested in 
Well, I started off in quality of life statistics and then I moved into well-being and then latterly happiness. And happiness is a great thing for connecting people right from, you know, the purpose of your nation, you know, includes the pursuit of happiness yeah. right down to the individual level where it makes sense to think about the happiness of ourselves, our families, our loved ones. And um, and I, I like drawing that connection all the way through. So that, that's what I try and do in my work. So whether I'm doing Happy Planet Index, which is global and basically about sustainability, can we create good lives that don't cost the earth, right through to my work on work, which is, you know, what makes for happy teams, which is uh, what I work on quite a lot at the moment. So tell me a little bit about, um, okay, so let's start here. The Happy Planet Index, fascinating yeah. concept, of course, right? Give us the broad strokes, and, and I have some, some just one or two questions to poke holes into it uh, in a yeah. friendly way, because I'm sure I won't be able to, but I will try, right? Oh, so, oh, well, yeah, I, yeah. I, tell, I, tell me I, the happy I, index thing. So basically, um, it's a critique of GDP per capita as the dominant measure of well-being of nations. And the critique really comes from a sustainability and a humanistic angle, which is that is that is that actually surely quality of people's life we can now ask them we can ask them how happy they were we can think about how long they live but the, probably one of the major challenges facing humankind now is the climate crisis so how good are we at turning the limited resources we have into good lives and that's really what the happy planet index becomes it's a it becomes three indicators how happy is a nation how long do they live and what's their ecological footprint which is basically their pressure on the planet and uh, you effectively divide the one by the other. So you have happiness times life expectancy, happy life years, and you divide that by ecological footprint to get an efficiency measure. How efficient is this nation at creating good lives that don't cost the earth? And it changes the rank order of the world, okay? So before you get your dig in, I'll get, I'll, go, <laughs> go ahead, I'll, go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll um, you know, two countries. I'll hold, so you, I'll hold you, on the dig in, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you've got some Latin American blood in you, so I'm not gonna <laughs> choose Chile, but Costa Rica, <laughs> Costa yes. Rica has higher happiness levels than the USA. They yes. live longer on average than people in the USA, and they use about a third, a quarter of the resources. So in a happy planet world, that will basically say that Costa Rica is doing better than the USA because it's efficient at turning its resources into good lives that don't cost the earth. So that's basically the premise of that. Okay, so, so a couple of follow-up questions, and then I'll dig a little bit. So it, it, this really resonates with me. The GDP part really resonates with me. I think you yeah. quoted in one, in one of your talks that Robert Kennedy gave the speech, and he basically says that you measure everything, but what, but but measure everything, but what makes life worthwhile, right? Yeah. Which is f brilliant, insightful. I think very true. It really speaks. I get it with the GDP part, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, it just measures one thing. Yeah. Now, uh, on on the opposite side of the spectrum. It seems like if the GDP is heavily weighted towards something that has nothing to do with well-being per se, tangentially have something to do with GDP, isn't sort of the ecological imprint also a bit too heavy on this one measurement and not necessarily uh, and tangential perhaps to long-term well-being of you know humanity in general, but not necessarily central to to well-being now. It's not it's, central to well-being now. Okay. It's uh, so well-being now is measured by the the um, by the top of the equation, which is basically happiness and life expectancy. So um, the idea of ecological footprint is futurity, which is basically to say that you know if if well-being is your aim, you need to think about it in a population. So I would say inequalities is really about inequalities of well-being, and I would go as far to say as sustainability is really about well-being through time which is are we are we leaving enough potential for future generations to generate right. okay so it's just a themselves. dimension or like a, just a, a, a macro dimension of this but not necessarily yeah. the very core of it so no. when, when you yes. go into into the core of well-being are they are there uh, like key factors that are just common to humanity in general like you can say hey here are the four things or three things, or one thing, or five things that are like you could because it's you have to be able to anchor this on on some key dimensions, right? What are those dimensions? Do you have those? Absolutely. So, I mean, it depends how you measure stuff. So, if you start thinking in terms of uh, nations, what are the things that start driving 
higher levels of well-being in nations. So, and one of them is is GDP per capita, right. which is that yeah. you know clearly clearly wealthier nations are happier. It's it's what we call a log relationship, which means that the the the, the uh, impacts get smaller and smaller. So over a certain amount, they, they don't become so significant, but they're still mm -hmm. there. So, so they um, plateau next, after a certain level, right? Well, they sort of plateau. The, the, the effects become smaller. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, a country like the UK or the US will not particularly get happier now for increasing its GDP per capita. Yes. It would be more so other sense. things that are driving it, um, yeah, yeah. which will be things like social trust. Uh, so do we feel we can trust people in our communities, in our society? That's going to drive it. Mm. Inequalities will drive it because effectively inequalities everybody slightly loses when inequality gets too much because there's too many upward comparisons compared to downward. So we basically tend to look up rather than down. So too much inequality tends to make more people yeah, feel worse. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, of course, you know, it's not nice to feel like you're in the bottom 20% of the society. You know, that has a self-esteem issue. It has effects on you all of the time. So, so basically inequalities matter. Um, but isn't that statistically, like if you think about it, statistically sort of neg uh, negligible for example in the in the developed world because there's a there's a relatively large middle class relatively small lower sort of income class and then whatever you know the upper class it's it's the one percent uh, compared to let's say sub-saharan africa where most of the sure. people are are just not wealthy so so basically the way you measure it is something called the Gini coefficient, which mm -hmm. is the distance from pure equality. Now, no one's suggesting that pure equality is a solution. Um, however, I don't really see much justification for rising inequalities, which right. is what we tend to be facing in Western nations at the moment. So I, I don't know the figures off the top of my head, uh, well enough for the US, but for the UK, inequalities were falling right from the 1920s, 30s, right through to about the 1980s mm -hmm. and then they started to rise again yeah, uh and um i i i don't really see much logic in inequalities rising very much you know as in from a this is from a well-being perspective you know you can talk about it from an economic perspective do we do we think in trickle down effects that that's worth it but in terms of happiness and life expectancy I, I wouldn't say you can make much of a case that rising, you can't make a case that rising inequalities are good for it. They, they tend to be undermining it. Undermining, so, yeah. so, I mean, at the end of the day, so we can look at this at a population level, so we can look at the strength of relationships and things like that. But really at an individual level, it's a lot to do with, yes, our personal circumstances. Like if you've got enough money, you can buy yourself out of frustrations, problems. If you don't, you know, they become a big problem. So if your car breaks down and you're poor, you've lost a month's income. If my car breaks down, I have an as annoyance. I call somebody to come and fix my car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hire a car if I need to. I get out of the problem. But sure. if you're poor, you don't have those options. So 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 definitely money at an individual level affects, but the main thing that drives our happiness is relationships. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about let's put a pin on that for just one second, because I wanna I want to visit one more question that I had on the macro level. Yeah. So you, you speak about Costa Rica, which is yeah. fascinating to me. And what I would like to ask you is this. Obviously, I mean, the most famous, the happiest people on earth are the Norway people, right? Uh, the people yeah. in Norway. And uh, I don't see much in common between Norway and Costa Rica. And, and how come they're in the same category? And how come Costa Rica is perhaps in your book above Norway? What are the factors there? So, yes, Scandinavian countries tend to come top. Finland tends to be top in the last few years. Yeah. And Norway has been top. Denmark has been top. Occasionally Switzerland and once Costa Rica has been in a, in a global survey. So, so there's a little bit of moving around the top, which is not really very statistically significant. It's just partly sure. just what happened. That so what are, what are the commonalities there between? So the commonalities are, so the reason that Scandinavian countries do well is social safety nets which uh -huh. is that the bottom 20% of earners in those countries are much less unhappy than say the UK or the US where we have steeper inequalities. Right. So it's not really that the 
the median person, the, the, the average person is much happier in Scandinavia. It's that the person, the bottom of the spectrum is much less unhappy. And that drives up the national mean. Does that make uh, sense? That makes a lot of sense. So this um, is, yeah. so the statistics are affected by the, the ex, sort of the extremes, I guess, I guess, right? It affects the yeah. mediums. That, that's what you're saying, yeah. essentially. So, so that's one factor. So strong social safety nets, but you know, but they have a lot of, they have a lot of socially inclusive policies in Scandinavia that do it. Now, what's the similarity with Costa Rica? Well, there's not really, it, it, there, there are some similarities. Uh, Costa Rica is more equal or less unequal than most countries in Latin America. Uh, they, uh, like all of Latin America, family is very, very important. Social relationships are very, very important in those areas. And that affects things a lot. Um, and in Costa Rica, particularly, they have much more, uh, much higher rates of literacy than many places in Latin America. They have much more equality for women uh, in, in Costa Rica than many places. Quite a lot of Latin America is still quite machismo, and uh, and so we don't have as much equality there. So if you're if you if you have a situation where fifty percent of the population feel undervalued, that's going to bring your average down. Um, and and they have no standing army, which is a sort of historical accident of Costa Rica. It's always been well protected by the US for lots of reasons. Um, you know, it used to be the shortest route before they built the Panama, Panama Canal. So it was a route for taking gold from San Francisco to New York was overland in Costa Rica. So there's lots of ways that the US has always slightly protected Costa Rica. Um, so it doesn't have a standing army in the same way as its, its countries are around it. So there are lots of reasons for Costa Rica being, being happier fascinating. than around. It's, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense on the on the social the social aspect of it compared to Denmark and, and the North countries. Do you find that the family values, relationships, family, extended family are equally important in the Nordic countries and Costa Rica? Or is that an outlier sort of dimension for Costa Rica? Oh, they're, they're important everywhere. And it's one of the reasons why... Central Eastern Europe, the former, um, you know, uh, communist bloc is actually quite unhappy. So um, they're very similar in GDP per capita and life expectancy than Latin America, but Latin America scores a lot higher. And that is all to do with relationships and family and community. Really? Wow. Yeah. Now, okay. Okay, now you got my interest on this one, obviously, because <laughs> I, I grew up both in Latin America and in the Soviet Union in the Eastern yeah. Bloc. I, I know that, I mean, 15 countries in the Eastern Bloc, I toured as an artist extensively, so I know that, that space very well. Um, can, you, can you unpack that a little bit? Because I'm curious about, I've never thought of that, of that dimension for the Eastern Bloc. What are the causes of that compared to, um, let's say, Nordic countries or Latin America? Well, I think uh, the causes will be multiple, but one of them is that in the Soviet area, community and, and place-based well-being was very undermined. Mm -hmm. People were moved around a lot. You know, they were moved from community to community, farm farm to farm. They were disrupted. They they disrupted the family ties at the bottom. So I think some of it is almost certainly a legacy of that. Um, wow. I don't know whether there's a sort of Slavic sort of cultural gene layer, or yeah. culture, yeah, yeah. but you know, if you know any, well, you do. And I know some Eastern Europeans, one of my kids is married to Eastern. I mean, they're, they're just slightly more dour. I once did a talk for where was it? I guess it was in Hungary and, and I saw my happiness and they go, well, it's almost rude to be happy here. You know, it's like yeah, people, you know, people are fairly like, <laughs> like grumpy, yeah. grumpy is cool. Yeah. Uh, sort of. Yeah. It looks, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's me. Like you can, you, you can be nice about it and say this is a very stoic sort of uh, culture, but you can, but you can say that about the Nordic people too, right? In theory, at least yeah. stereotypically. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. I think it's just people are just in general more somber. And I mean, is it the weather? Well, the Nordic countries have bad weather as well. Uh, but man, that's really fascinating. That I mean, the disruption yeah. of the family unit, the community texture. Uh, for generations, it, it it this resonates with me as 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 being true. Yeah, I mean they're definitely more pessimistic as nations than uh, Scandinavia. So I once saw saw this brilliant study which was about weather, which sounds a bit weird, but but they asked people in the survey how many days did the sun shine last month, right? And they knew geographically where they were, so they could actually 
see how many days the sun shone and so then you get misreporting systematic misreporting is that and right? basically okay. what what you kind of found was that in the sort of eastern block i'm not going to get it exactly right but they underestimated the number of sunny days by three or four and in copenhagen they overestimated it by three or four so you know so somewhere in the way just either way we, we remember things and where we pay attention to them you know people in 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 uh, scandinavia are much more positive and optimistic yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense it does make a lot of sense i mean and, and especially because you can compare those cultures side by side weather wise and remove that as a factor because they both have yeah. similar you yeah. know like not a lot of sunshine a lot of cold fog whatever you know um but it's fascinating yeah that's that's a really fascinating insight i've never thought of it that way and i think it's powerful all right so uh, can we make that connection between statistician and psycho yeah. psychology and uh yeah. trained therapist what what have you discovered there especially in a my let's go from micro macro to micro here that's fascinating that you are that well, person my, all in one you know my mother was a family therapist, so I was kind of interested in family therapy. And, and actually, I think my father went to quite a lot of sort of encounter groups and things like that. He was a, he was a um, CEO of a company. He was quite forward thinking in that way. He would take his senior managers on retreats. So they were both quite, you know, um, into into a personal awareness. And, and, I, and I, I was very interested in them and interested in what they were doing. And so... I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I started going on some courses, some weekend courses, and eventually I signed up for a three-year training. And it was definitely one of the best things I've ever done. I, I was almost certainly too young to become a therapist. I didn't become a therapist. I was like 25. But I, uh, it really taught me a lot about knowing yourself. I mean, you know, I, I will say rather grandly that Socrates always said, know thyself. And that's why I became a therapist. I don't really know where I learned that phrase, to be honest. But I think knowing yourself means you can you can be a servant to the the, the causes that you most uh, want to do more cleanly. Because if you're sort of driving things out of your unconscious, I think you're likely to create distortions and things. So so I, I, I thought that was a good idea. And I and I love the training. And I I definitely, absolutely, certainly my psychotherapy training has changed the way that I do statistics. It's fascinating because that, that's how I feel about economics in my life. Yeah, you know, I've never, I mean, I, I worked, I think, very briefly as an economist right out, out of college, but it had an imprint for the rest of my life because that lens yeah. is still there. There's certain things that you can't unlearn. Yeah. Uh, and I think it may be something like that for you. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, know thyself, uh, an unexamined life, it's not worth living, that kind of yeah. stuff, right? Now, can I get it personal just for a second here, uh, since we went there in that into the micro yeah. level? How has that self awareness helped you be a happy person, just personally? You know, you're a student of that on a micro level. How does that play out on in your life? I guess. Well, life has an ability to throw things at you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> and yes, it uh, does. so, you know, um, it, I, I think it. I, I think that I know that. I, I'm not very good at shallow relationships. I now need to have deeper relationship with friends and partners and things like that. So I think that's important. I'm very reflective as a human being, which I think is what's creative about my work with statistics is that I don't just repeat things. I really think things through. So, um, and I, I, as a person, I don't know, in some ways, actually, when you, when you get into therapy, I think in some ways you open yourself to having, less happy moments because you you basically you can't gloss over things anymore can you if you really start so there's a there's a cost to awareness sometimes but um but it definitely gives you more choice i mean i you know i'm in in, in my mid 50s now and I, I i certainly lead a life of my own choosing uh you know i'm with a partner i i, I really enjoy spending time with um I have relatively good relationships with my kids. I, I think I have good relationships with my kids, but they might say different. You'd have to ask them. But I, you know, so, so Probably I, Probably week, know, in that... from week to week, it may vary, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, you know, it was just, just, we just had Christmas. So we, that's always, that's always a whole that went sometimes, well. isn't it? Uh, yeah, it did go well. It did go well. But it, you also having guests in your house for a long time is tiring too, isn't it? So there's, yes, there's it always is. sides to it. But, um, but I, 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 um, yeah, it's definitely influenced who I am. And I think, yeah, it gives me more choices. And I, I, you know, people will come and sort of naturally seek me out for advice and things like that. And I'll sit and talk and listen with people. 
you know, so it's still there in me, the therapist. Yeah. That's good. I really, I feel like uh, when I read this about you after watching some of the, some of your work on sort of macro level, it, it, I, I, I made the connection. I felt like, okay, this is, I can see the influence of your self-awareness ability to feel, understand people from the inside out and how that translates into a passion to pursue that on a micro level and work with countries, work with uh, companies, corporations, things like that. So it's, it's, you can, I can, I can, I can see, I can tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. So um, in one of your materials that I was reading up on, uh, you, you have this very simple diagram that basically separates two factors that sort of feed into the happiness of, of a human being, and that's exter external conditions and personal resources. Can you, uh, can you unpack the external conditions, I think, are self-evident, but can you unpack the personal resources? How, how, you've, how you have seen that in your life, how you see that across the world, how do you measure those things? Um, what are the commonalities? Because you don't want to over, like you don't want to put everybody in the same bucket. At the same time, we're all human beings, we're all homo sapiens. And there's got to be some rules of thumb on on the on the personal resources part, right? Come on, you really have read my stuff because that is um, it's 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 a piece of work we called the dynamic model of well being. Uh, we 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 did it me and my team. I worked in a think tank for over a decade, and we did it for the UK government office of science, really aimed at policymakers. And um, the model is that uh, we have at the bottom of the model we have. Yeah, um, personal circumstances, uh, personal uh, resources and conditions of life. In the middle is about what we do and at the top is what we feel. And the idea is that these all come together to produce a sort of dynamic model about how people feel in the world. And, and at the bottom is the sort of inputs, basically. If you turned it on its side, you'd have an input output model. We put it on top so it felt more like an emergent property. And um, yeah, so the, 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 the conditions of life are effectively what people who are politically center of left tend to talk about a lot which is that you know do people have good opportunities and the personal resources is more speaking to the right which thinks about it's down to personal energy personal whatever and basically in models they both exist both pathways exist so we try to include them both and it was a political model for that reason was to try and be inclusive to in, in the UK, the Labour Party and the Conservatives. And, and so um, it, in that way, it was quite deliberate. But, uh, but the personal resources is really the stock of uh, strengths that we have, our genetics, our, um, our personalities and things like that. And so we are, we're not static as human beings. We change through the decades. And so it's sort of an, an assessment of, you know, our sort of, capital rather than our flow so if the top well-being is sort of a flow of what we experience the personal resources is sort of our resilience and our stock of who we are um and it, it comes out of the psychological literature really which is that we know that people that feel good basically um build their psychological resources so they do better in the future so what you are feeling now will shape how you experience it and you can think of it like this you know you can think of it at a micro level that if someone says something good to you you feel expanded you feel more confident if someone says something negative to you you feel more protected and hunched so you you collapse in and that's happening at both a, a moment to moment basis but also through our lives you know the child that comes from a very uh loving a securely attached, to use a Bowlby term, family is going to feel much more confident and resilient than a child that comes from uh, a challenging family background where there's a lot of uh, conflict and interpersonal issues between their parents or the wider family or, or with them even. So that inevitably a child brought up in that environment is going to feel more uh, defensive and all sorts of things and has got layers to unpeel as they become adults. So so th th those are the sort of things that are going on in personal resources. You know, the it's really fascinating to what you just pointed out just a few seconds before that these two things are essentially the lines along which the parties divide, right? Yeah. External, you know, uh, so in, in the American, in American politics, that, that would be the left is probably leaning towards external resources, uh, or conditions rather, and then personal resources is the right. And uh, b sort of creating a model in a, in a clarity around both matter, <laughs> Yeah, you would think that would create a bit of a more center, center, center focused 
polit policy or politics in the country. But we see, we see this. You know, we're we're more divided. I think in America, at least. I don't know how it is in the UK, but it feels like the right is more right, the left is more is more left. What is the problem there? In in your, I mean, you you, you were in a think tank. You should you should know how to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> if I would, I, if, if, if I could, I mean, I mean, I think lots of people have got very sensible solutions to the problem, but I, it's just the system is not ready to change. And anyway, right, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think we, I think we, the, the dividing out of it has a lot to do with social media and the way that anger travels so quickly, and right. and that we have a negativity bias. So we, we 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 read things which feel dangerous to us, and and they travel very quickly. So I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of narrow truths or or, or or untruths out on the internet and so really if you're if you're uh, for me a political system should be should be from the center i mean i i've called myself a radical moderate through my career right you know i'm very moderate in what i want but i'm radically in favor of moderateness you yeah, know I'm, and i'm the same way yeah, yeah I, I feel like i've i've personally in my personal views have gone uh well when i was a kid i was you know brought up by a couple of Marxists, so that doesn't count. But as a grown-up, I think I was, in my youth, slightly left of center. And as I age, I go a little bit right of center. But that's it. Like, that's, that's the extent of my... The fluctuation yeah. is very, you know, it's not yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. It's just yeah, fascinating. It, I mean, I think what I quite like about politics that are slightly left to center is the levers are... At a macro level, we were talking about inequalities and yes. education uh -huh. and things like that. And so, so in that sense, but of course, the motivation for all of us is a very personal, yeah. you know, it's like I can talk about those big, you know, factors that influence uh, happiness at a national level. But my motivation is still going to be very personal. Very personal. I'm going to still, yeah. yeah, you know, it's going to be, you know, uh, how's my work going? You know, uh, how am I getting along with my wife? Am I doing things that are fun, you know, and, 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 um, you know, fun and meaning, you know, basically they become the, the two big things in life, I think is pleasure and meaning. And are you getting enough of them? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, about what you, what you just touched upon, right? Um, what, what's your experience studying those things? Because we've, we've talked about all kinds of macro things and we can geek out on that, but meaning ple uh, pleasure meaning i mean there's different formulations but a very they're you know in social sciences uh, i think i think it's meaning pleasure significance for sure pleasure enjoyment the social aspect that's it i mean it's not a massive like people agree on on these things well they're biological at the end of the day yeah i mean i'm you know i'm you know in that we, we have sort of three big groups of emotions. We have ones which come from threat. So from, 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 you know, from fear and anger and sadness, loss, you know, we have ones which come from striving, you know, we have emotions around enthusiasm, eagerness, interest, where we're striving and setting goals. And then we have ones which are more about nourishment, which are about relationships, about calmness, serenity. And so if we look at life, you know, life is about survival so that's avoiding threats but then i think it's about accomplishing things in a way i think that very much not in terms of me personally but what can i contribute so i think more broadly than that but you know for some people it's about personal accomplishment and then it's about enjoying life in the sense of like having time to feel peaceful not to always feel you're stressed and things then to have good relationships and really those are the only big three sets of emotions we have you know once driven by, you know, dopamine, another one by, um, uh, you know, the threats are, 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 are by, by different types adrenaline, of hormones. So, yeah. yeah, adrenaline and um, oxytocin, things like that. Right? Oxytocin was the one I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, the bonding, and, uh, the bonding hormone. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, 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 you know, that's what's going on underneath, as long as we can accept that we're a, we're a bag of chemicals. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, well, you know, and but I do think I'm actually going to go back to. I, I would like to visit the bag of chemicals thing um, in a second. Uh, the Thomas Jefferson quote of pursuing happiness, Declaration of Independence, right? I think he penned that part of it. Uh, it's based on, uh, I, I believe, the English philosopher John L uh, Locke's pursuit of life, liberty, and property. 
Mm. Um, I'm sure you're aware of that. And yeah. how do you, first of all, how do you, why do you think Jefferson added happiness instead of property? What's your, what's your take um, on it? I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a historian in this case. I do know. And I remember reading a bit about it quite some time ago that it was debated whether it was pursuit of property or pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. uh, as they write. And I suppose, I mean, happiness also, there was a different understanding of the word happiness in 17, whatever it was, 1776, is that when it was yeah. written? The Constitution? Yeah, 1776, um, yeah. Um, then, then now, you know, I mean, happiness, the word happiness historically comes from the word luck, you know, so happenstance, okay. haphazard, mm -hmm. happiness. Fortune, uh, your it, fortune. Yeah. Sort of and good, so, yeah, good so, fortune, not fortune in money, but good fortune in. Yeah, good fortune. So in some ways, they probably meant more pursuit of good fortune, pursuit mm -hmm. of good circumstances than what we mean about happiness. So I think the words property and happiness were much closer together now. Now they feel quite different. They I do. think 250 yeah. years ago, I think they felt more similar. Yeah, that's so uh, that I think is one factor. Um, and, and, but, you know, we had a, we had a huge um, eruption of new values going on at the end of the 18th century. You know, we had the French revolution, you know, as well, you know, and so there was, a, and, and this came after hundreds of years of very, very hierarchical European aristocracy based mm -hmm. systems, you know, I mean, you'd had so much less freedom in France and the UK, you know, 300 years ago, you know, you, you had to do, you were a serf, you had to do what you were told, you know, unless you were sitting on top of the pile. So it's quite difficult to sort of uh, imagine what they were talking about. But of course, the US, the America, the founding was, was, a, was a pursuit of freedom, wasn't it? It's a pursuit of being in control of your own life. It was a rebellion against that, quite mm -hmm. rightly. A rebellion against that oh, very yeah. very hierarchical european system so um we've got a lot of thank for that you know the french revolution helped to uh, all sorts of things did in fact i mean i hear i've heard a very good treatise on that actually the values are much closer to uh first nation american people than they are to european in the sense that you know uh first nation people in the us were living very freely and I think Europeans who went there sort of started to understand that life could be a bit different than we've had it in Europe. That's obviously what they were looking for to go there. And obviously there was a little bit of genocide that went on along there, but the values, I think, quite interestingly, probably came through. Yeah, that's fascinating. Do you think the values, uh, okay, let me, let me pre, 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 preface this with this. There's a, I'm sure you're aware of the, the, long, the, the longest study on, on human satisfaction, the Harvard study, that went for about 80 years, I believe. And then it, what they distilled out of it as the most heavily weighed factors for human satisfaction or happiness are family, friends, meaningful work, and faith, right? The faith yeah. thing came a bit of as, uh, and by faith they mean a, a sort of a macro level view of things, your place on, you know, a, a belief in the transcendent, like transcending yourself, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm. So it could be uh, other other different faiths and not just one faith or the the, the yeah. main faith, uh, but really more of a know thyself in the in the sense of your place in the world, where you're going, the significance of all of this. So, and that surprised me. I, I, that's one thing I thought. Okay, that's I wouldn't expect that from a Harvard study, right? Mm. I would expect that maybe from a theological treatise of some sort. But both Thomas Jefferson and John Locke. Uh, Locke um, he, they they have this endowed by God by their Creator to the pursuit mm. blah 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 blah. Do you think th that piece in Harvard in the Harvard study and that piece in Jefferson and John Locke uh, was that it was that a cultural religious cultural context that imprinted that or was that something objective that actually is important? So I I, I have very little knowledge about um uh how much faith was shaping things like the american constitution but i do know the data quite well on re religiosity mm -hmm. and happiness and it's definitely a positive is it relationship yeah. um that's for certain in all of the data um and there are at least a couple of elements to that one is the community value that you get from being part of 
some sort of religious community that you you have people that you feel are like you and that you can you can trust and get along with so in that sense it's it's that's totally non-spiritual it's mm -hmm. human connectedness and then there there is some other data which is which is less clear on the sort of um intrinsic spirituality um that has an effect that people feel if they're connected to something bigger than themselves they feel happier mm -hmm. more in place you know is that you know talking about marx is that opium with the people is it yes, exactly, is yes. it or is, is it you know i mean the thing is that it, you know it's certainly there in the data i mean but you have some you ha you have some other things in data like if you ask people whether they're left of center or right of center people who are right of center are happier than people who are left of center are and they? that's a, that's a strong result that comes through yeah across all of the world oh i didn't know that that. If you, oh. and and actually it makes some sense if your sense of satisfaction in the world includes a bigger picture of the world that you feel is unequal surely that's going to have an effect on you as a human right. being oh that, Whereas makes, if that you, makes sense yeah if, if you come from the right which is just a gross simplification but is more like the status quo and maintaining it and you think the world is right we'll protect it i'm right in the world so you can understand how that comes now does that really mean that you should be maximizing human happiness all the time and you should push everyone to the right i don't personally believe so but I, it does come out in the data and of course what we have in the data is the, there's self reports and so there's right. a possibility yeah, yeah. that mm -hmm. that some of us are I mean, you, you you get into a real real difficulty of saying, can you trust the data? Can you not, and whatever like that. But if they're at the margins, these effects. That's really fascinating. And, you know, now that we went sort of full circle to the left and right part, uh, it's fascinating to me now that I think of it in talking to you that you you can almost like if you if you say left external conditions are is the focal point, right is personal resources focal point. You can see how. People that are right, 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 they can go, uh, yeah, you're, you guys are over-focusing on external, external conditions. And if you make yeah. them super, super awesome, these external conditions for everybody, yeah. top down, it's going to actually ruin people and take their, their happiness away because of the welfare state, all of that, th that whole sort of chain of thought. And then the reverse is true as well, because oh. the, you know people that focus on the external conditions, they would go to the extreme right, let's say, and go, you guys are so selfish. You are so selfish and you're just, yeah. you're focusing only on yourself and you're you're making yourself rich and your country rich and the whole world is suffering for it and yeah. you're ruining it for everybody else right it's yeah. it's fascinating how that the focal point literally determines uh, the attack points on the other side and it is also partly what you attend to is what you what you attend to is what you what you Correct, um, yeah what you what gives yeah attention so it's it's more difficult to yeah we're all super biased basically so yeah <laughs> so, basically. yeah. so uh, i saw a picture of you and the dalai lama uh, uh -huh. what is yeah I, I i tell me about the the experience of being in the presence of someone so revered worldwide and I mean, look, I, I, the picture, of course, captures a 45 second conversation with His <laughs> Holiness. That changed your life forever, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it's, 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 he just looked at me a certain have. way, and the rest of my life was redefined by that moment because he looked, looked at me this particular way. I'm just kidding, of course. But tell me, um, tell me more. Enough to put a scar, uh, give me a scarf. So I was speaking at a conference that he was speaking at. Ah. And, um, and, he um, was obviously talking about happiness, and so was I. And um, I got introduced to him. I, 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 I'm a, been to what, what I spoke to him about was that I'm I was at that time a trustee of an organisation called Action for Happiness in the UK, for which he is the patron. And so I just said that's who I was, and and uh, and we talked about um, actually secular happiness as opposed to spiritual uh, happiness. But it was literally a forty five second conversation yeah <laughs> that made it into the internet now you're best friends with the dalai lama that i know things. yeah that's what i think you know i would like to think I, that i i came back from it and uh, i said to my son who was about 10 at the time i said ah oh, i think i want to become a buddhist monk you know <laughs> and he looked and he looked at me and he goes well you've got the body already dad oh <laughs> that's fantastic that's fantastic <laughs> 
I think I, I think I'd already bought him a fat Buddha once before because uh, you know I, I'm not a Buddhist, uh, uh, but I but I <laughs> obviously attracted to it. So I did. Yeah. That's a lot to be attractive. Uh, yeah, to attracted to in the Buddhist um, yeah in the Buddhist thought process for sure. You know I. Yeah, I, I dove into a lot of that in the in my early days, but um, there's a lot there yeah. that's interesting. So yeah. right next, obviously, uh, right next to the, uh, to Nepal is Bhutan, yeah. and you talk about um, in some of your talks about sort of the hap- national happiness index, something along those lines. Can you tell gross me gross national happiness? Gross yeah. national happiness, which is fascinating as a concept, of of course, deeply inspiring, but on a on a like real life level, how does that play out from the idea and a statement that resonates, right, to let's say life in Bhutan specifically? Do you know? So, gross national happiness did not start as a statistical idea. It started as a, um, a sort of vision that the um, oh, the king before last, or maybe even the one before that, um, had. And basically, what he wanted to say was that. He, it was a rejection of the sort of dominant economic development paradigm. And he said that basically yeah. Bhutan should be built on its traditional strengths of Buddhism and community and uh, and things. And, and, and he called it gross national happiness very inspiringly. And it had, had, I think, originally five pillars to it and whatever. I got involved in the early 2000s when they started thinking about can we measure gross national happiness? Yeah. And, I, I went to three or four conferences there. I, I worked for some sort of sabbaticals, sort of two, three months there on how you could measure it. Um, I would love to say that they really, they really championed my ways of doing it. I, they didn't really, they went a different route. Okay. Um, so, um, but it was, I, I haven't really been, I haven't been back to Bhutan since 2012, so 10 years now. So I don't, really have a firm ground in it. But the difference between 2003 and 2012, when I went there was quite profound. It was was developing fast Bhutan. It was becoming more democratic in that basically it had been sort of a benign dictatorship by the king. The king abdicated so his son could take over so they could have more democratic forms of election. Um, and I think I think that's, um, that's good. There's a lot of challenges in Bhutan. But you know, if you were in a in that geopolitical region, you could, you know, you had Nepal, you had Chinese occupied Tibet to the north, you have separatist states like Sikkim and, and you know, difficult areas in, in, in India. So it's, it's a really peaceful place there. It's, it's, it's got its own challenges. It's, there's been some ethnic cleansing in the south of Nepalese refugees. So it's not Shangri-La. But they, 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 they certainly, the politicians I knew 15 years ago very much had a very spiritual approach and very much the people first. I, I think inevitably with an opening up that it's got more Asian issues going on again now, you know, corruption and things like that. But it's, it's certainly a very interesting area. That I, I don't like their measure of gross national happiness, but I am a statistician involved in this area, so I'm going to have very strong opinions. Is it a noble cause? Yes. yes. Is it better they have a measure than, than not? Yes. I, I don't happen to like their actual measure. <laughs> Interesting. Well, thanks for <laughs> thanks for offering that up because I was I was fascinated. And obviously, sound bites travel fast, as you say, right? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's precisely why I wanted to ask you in more detail. Okay, you were there. You sort of dove into it. How does that look like in real life? Uh, but it's yeah. really fast. But I, I do think that regardless of the outcomes, which way they go, and you know, humans met, we mess everything up, right? So you know, <laughs> it's, it's it's just true. It's it's not a straight line. And yet, the fact that a a ruler, a, a ruling sort of body, the leaders of a country would actually say those things, and at least explore, and and correct and solve issues towards human flourishing, that's a big deal, actually. Yeah, you know, in that sense, in the, like em, like shifting the emphasis, shif- shifting almost like the 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 focal point of the whole thing from from pure economic development, which obviously it's, has very limited effect um, on on human flourishing. I mean, yeah, look at it. We're talking about it. Bhutan's only got 650, 750,000 people. It's a small, tiny place. Mm. People know Bhutan. They know Bhutan for a couple of things. For the king, 
because he got married relatively recently and for gross national happiness. That's what they know for. So they've done something very right in their marketing of their nation, you know, and uh, and and they they've been, you know, relatively closed, you know, in that they, they haven't encouraged tourism because they saw what happened with Nepal and they didn't really want that to happen, you know. Mm. So so there's there's a lot of consciousness, but um, they've got a lot of challenges, you know, you know, they've got a significant percentage of the population. So when I was there, this is again, 10 years I'm pretty sure 30 percent of the population will with more than five hours walk from a road oh, so wow. you know this is a pretty pretty rural area yeah and so you know health centers are difficult you know they would have health centers up in the village but you know uh you know they were bringing electricity to more and more parts of more, more parts of the country but you know there's a there's a big catch up in development there and and like every country that's got those challenges they've got challenges with you know rights between men and women and all sorts of things but they were gloriously beautiful uh, you know and and warm and welcoming and 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 buddhist nations just you know if i look at the data purely i've never actually tried to make a variable that says buddhist nation but i know that vietnam arm does better than you would expect for its gdp to capita bhutan does um so you know probably buddhism helps people feel happier as a nation yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. would say interesting fascinating so tell me about uh, we need to wrap it up pretty soon running out of time i would speak to you for hours but um, uh, tell me about your your current work the, the 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 things that you focus on i think you mentioned the book also working with corporations things like that yeah so i i did my ted talk in 2010 and obviously things went a bit crazy for a while and and i i did some speaking and you know you can earn quite good money speaking in the states but i I sort of found it a little soulless and I kind of wanted to do something more useful. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll work, you know, people spend a lot of time at work. If I'm genuinely interested in reaching people about how to live happier lives, work is a really good way of thinking about that because the great thing is there's a win-win in there, which is that happy employees are, uh, you know, are, are more productive, more creative, more innovative, you know, all sorts of things. So, um, so that's what I, I, I've been working at. And, um, it's taken me a while because, you know, as a basically an outsider to a field to think about how do I want to measure that? How do I want to measure the happiness of teams? Uh, what's the best way to that? What's the best route to actually creating change? So the therapist in me wants to build positive change. So um, so I've sort of designed a, a, a statistical system for businesses to measure the happiness of their employees really and, now, do and you it's, focus it's on that, small mid uh, enterprise level well, business or is it doesn't so, matter? so we, we focus on smes yeah mm -hmm. um, um uh, mainly not because i don't think large organizations could do what we do it's just um it's it's a easier market to break into there's a lot of them and they 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 don't have huge procurement processes <laughs> to be very honest you know it's you know when you work with big organizations you get into a, 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 a you know a lot of challenges to sort of meet all their requirements so so we work with, with smes mainly we, we, mm -hmm. we have some larger clients too um but we're team-based in the sense that actually everything you talk about with happiness is about relationships happiness at work is very very strongly about your relationships with your peers with your line manager uh, yes, is the work meaningful and important to you too? But the most important thing is whether the relationships are good. So we try and basically become a, a team building tool, which is that we ask people every week, how happy were you this week and create an indicator, which just shows goes up and down because life goes up and down. You know, people have good and bad weeks and we, we reflect that back. So the therapist in me would always want to listen and reflect back. The data is the same. You listen to the teams, you reflect it back to them. So basically you create what I would call a learning feedback loop, which basically helps them learn for themselves. And that's mm -hmm. basically what I do. So it's really helping, particularly team leaders have a very difficult job, you know, leading a team, which is a complex network of relationships and people are tricky. You know, how do they, how do they, with very little training, how can they be a good team leader? So we try and give them data every week that can help them be a better team leader. Can you give me an, uh, maybe like a top three things for a, for a team leader, a business leader? that they could focus on that, that so the, the, the big five drivers of happiness at work are connect be fair being fair okay. empowering people challenging them and inspiring them so yeah. you can look at maslow you can see daniel pink in there you can see whatever but it's more right. relational than yeah, daniel yeah. pink will ever say he mm -hmm. he will talk about you know meaning uh 
what is it called? Meaning, meaning mastery and autonomy. They're great, autonomy, but yes. you also need yeah. you need the relationships too. So um, and and so those are the big five drivers. But then that 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 really collapses down to every week talking to your team how they are and, and what's you know friction flow. What what's gone well for you this week? What hasn't? Mm-hmm. Build on what has gone well. Deal with the friction. So. I don't know if you know Teresa Rombali. Do you know her as a researcher who wrote no, no, a book called the, Pro- the Progress Principle? She wrote a very good book. Okay. She studied thousands of diaries about people's experience of daily work. And really, she came to two conclusions, which is that the most important thing is that people progress their work every day and they don't have big setbacks. I mean, she's got other things in there too, but the biggest thing is, are they, are they, and so in that way, I think friction and flow are really, really critical to how people feel. Do you think, uh, and, I, and I think that's a hugely important topic, the work that you do in general. I mean, we spend eight hours a day on average, yeah. right? In these environments. Yeah. If, if they, if they make us miserable, it's just not a very good life, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and at it's, the it's... same time, if you are thriving, <laughs> oh my gosh, the, the impact that you can have on the world the change that you can have, you can create things, services, products. Uh, you can serve a lot of people, right? It's a big, yeah. big deal. It's it's a big lever, let's put it that way, in the human experience. Yeah. Um, do you think that like the dynamics are are so are powerful enough to perhaps um, not override, but oh, but sort of decrease this sort of this very ethereal, popular thing? Like, am I inspired? Am I uh, um, do I, does this make, this this job make me feel alive? Uh, that part that seems a bit more like fluff. It's not necessarily fluff. I'm not saying it's fluff. But what I'm saying is, is the environment, like you just have a great, I just love my team, right? And this is great. More important than, am I living out my, my purpose in, in work? Maybe I'm, I'm I'm stating the the dilemma incorrectly. No, I mean in a way we're this thing between pleasure and meaning, aren't we? Mm. I think if you're not enjoying your work, you you get depleted, and you're never going to be able to do things which you think are meaningful and contributing. So, I just think you need them both. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, and I think, I mean, actually, I think relationships are, are more important, and I think it's a slightly sort of office-based, desk-based, middle-class thing to talk about meaning. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it is. Uh, and, 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 and I think that rich, rich people problems, right? So I guess, yeah, it's a, you know, it's not that it's not without something, but it's, yeah, you know, people's meaning could be very personal. Mm-hmm. You know, my meaning of work is that I earn the money to feed my family. That's a deeply meaningful yeah. activity and relational as uh, well. Right. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think we can get a little bit grandiose sometimes around meaning that, you know, and, and I'm someone that's been relatively successful and I still feel like massively unsuccessful, unachieving. <laughs> you know, you know there's, always, <laughs> there's always someone who will make you feel like a loser just compared to, to what they've done in life, right? So I, I don't mean about feeling a loser. I just mean as an I'd like to have had a million times as much impact as I'd had. I mean, true, as in, I, I kind oh, of agree with me. I agree with me. So I would like, to, <laughs> you know, I've, I, and I, I don't say that, you know, I, I've no particular economic, oh, yes, I do have an economic interest in my business. and I don't mind making money, but I'm much more into like, can I create something that does social good? That's much more important. to me. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I think that's yeah. really fascinating what you said, actually reflects what the question is that on one level, you want your life to mean something, right? So yeah. what you just said, on another level, well, that's all very relative, and the joy of being able to collaborate with people, do something meaningful, feed your family, have the Christmas that you just had with your kids, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, yes and, probably, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. All right, but, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before I let you go, I want you to talk about the, the five-minute happiness checkup because that's oh, something yeah. very immediate that people can can that listen to this episode or watch it somewhere can can take and it will be helpful to them. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's well hopefully be helpful to them. But basically it's it's called Friday One. 
Friday so one. Friday okay. one, o, o and E. My business is called Friday Pulse. So uh, because we ask people on Friday how they were, but this is called Friday one. And basically it's a one-off questionnaire about your happiness at work. It takes five minutes to do mm-hmm. and it generates an automatic report. So a bit like those ones which we got about 16 personalities you know you take this this is what you are it's like a mirror but it's about your immediate context of work now and it asks you questions that you can reflect on so it's very easy to do and it's fun and it gives you an idea about what measurement of happiness at work is a bit about all right everyone if you're listening to this or watching this on youtube uh five minutes of your time and it's a, a lot of value for five minutes of your time to just stop reflect be self-aware and find your place where you're at right now and then perhaps you can you can know what to do next uh nick marks thanks for coming on the show i really really appreciate it thank you very much for having great